when I was becoming a Christian, when I was walking through, walking on the path to become a Christian, Luke played an incredible uh, role in that. And and part of what we're talking about today is 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 um, is at the root of myself at the age of thirty becoming a Christian. I, I've titled this. Um, series, or this first part of the study, uh, Gabriel's Prediction of John's Birth. And it is, and we won't experience that this week, we'll experience it next week, but um, maybe the subtitle maybe gives a little more insight to where I'm going to go with this today. What we're talking about here is, is, and I've included the motto, this is one of the mottos of my life, God's will, God's plan, and God's time. Say it again, God's will, God's plan, in God's time. I have embraced this. I, I wish I could give credit to whoever I stole it from. I'm sure I did. Um, but that's hard to do. And we see a perfect example today, a absolute perfect example of, of being in God's will, embracing God's plan, and working in God's time. Uh, our, our, our main characters, uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth, are the parents of John. And, and what's nice about this is Luke being a historian, remember who he's speaking to in this book, the Greeks, he is going, he's going to frame this story. He's going to, before he gets to the Christmas story, he's going to go back and logically set this up in such a way that these Greeks who are studying what the perfect man is are going to be able to see the whole picture, not just the story of Christ's birth, which is amazing but the whole picture that led up to it. And we're gonna see, I think, clearly displayed here today that, that, that God's will will be done. His plan will be accomplished and it will be done in his time. And often as I open sermons, I will close with a question here today, but I, I pose you a question. What do you do when your plans, your ideas, what you want accomplished, they don't match up with God's plans? I ask if anybody's experienced that, it'd be a silly question because we all have. And if you haven't, it will. It will happen. You will set up what you think you want tomorrow to look like, and God will send a completely different tomorrow. And the truth of it is, if we look at the motto that we're talking about here today, most of us are okay with God's plan, especially if you're older because you've been through the gauntlet enough and you've come out the other side and you realize boy, I really wanted that person in my life. And God said, no. And a couple of years later, you go, I'm really glad that God didn't put that person in my life. That's just an example. But we can give examples like that all the time. The problem we had is often with God's timing. If you're battling cancer or your child is sick, you don't want to hear God say, I need you to wait. It's not going to be okay tomorrow. It's tough. And would the characters that we deal with today address this, address this beautifully. And, and because of the simplicity and the directness of how Luke writes, we sometimes miss it. So I want to, I want to kind of tackle that today. Let me give you a little bit of background. This story is the beginning of the end of what academia, what the theologians call the 400 years of silence. And what do I mean by that? If you, if you, if you have your Bible with you and, you and you go to the beginning of the New Testament, just flip a couple of pages back, we run into a prophet called Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little, a little bit about that today to put it in context. But after Malachi, there is no voice of God for 400 years until the next prophet, who is John the Baptist. Now, it does not mean that there was nothing going on. Uh, in the culture of this period of time, when Malachi finished his book, the Persians ruled the world. And they were big and bad. And they, they, they were a tough nation. Now, as we open up uh, Luke and we, we start to talk about the, the birth of John the Baptist, the Romans are in charge. The culture of the Jewish people has changed too. It, it's not that that everything froze, and because God's voice wasn't heard, the world kept moving on. But God thought it so that He was going to keep it quiet for a while. He wasn't going to have to send a prophet, and He's going to fulfill a promise that we're going to see here in just a little bit. 
Uh, bear with me as I kind of give you a little bit of a history lesson, because if you're new to this Christian thing, you, you, you wonder why we keep talking about priest and priesthood and why that matters. Very briefly, when the priesthood was created, and if you study the Bible, you know when. It's when Moses led the Israelites, well, God led the Israelites out of, out of Egypt, and they, he set up the Israeli nation. And part of that is um, having structure, having rules. So what God did is he, he anointed Aaron, Moses' brother, to be what we would call the high priest. Because there was two sets of, uh, of, of things that God really concerned him with. One was the law, so how do you do things? And the other part was the worship of him. How do we have the relationship with him? So laws and relationships. And the, the priesthood was extremely important. And, uh, and as the years went by, and we come up to the time of John, well, the priesthood has changed. Uh, it, it is, did God want to change? No, not at all. It's, I don't know if I'd use the word corrupt, but it is not what God ever intended initially. So keep that in mind as we tackle the story of John uh, the Baptist, because his father, Zechariah, is a priest. And I'll explain that to you. I, I talked to you about the influence of the period of the time. Rome is now in charge. Um, and this is, is amazingly orchestrated by Luke, but this is really the first character of what we call the Christmas story. It, he goes back far enough to when he's reflecting this to these Greeks, these well-educated men, that he gives them enough information to be able to go, yes, this is true. This is correct. And I want to share with you uh, the last part of Malachi. If you don't have it, it's okay. I'll, I'll read it to you. I have it right here. This is what, um, through God, Malachi, uh, God speaking in Ma through Malachi, he, he says this. Remember, and this is the last of the Old Testament before the silence. Remember the instructions of Moses, my servant. The statues and the ordinances I commanded him to, at or uh, of, of Israel. Look, I'm going to send you a prophet like Elijah, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And then he finishes with this. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers and their children to the children and the children's hearts of the, to their fathers. Otherwise, otherwise, last word of God, otherwise I will come and strike the land with a curse. Exit God, 400 years. And the reason I share this with you is because as we look at John, as, as we, we experience the relationships he had and the encounters he had, one of the main questions that the Jews are going to ask him is, are you Elijah? Are you this guy? When God last spoke, are you him? So all of this needs to be organized and, and bullet pointed and directed so whoever reads this fully understands that John just wasn't a happening. It was an absolute miracle of God. And it shows what we're, what I'm going to demonstrate, the three things that God is, is he, he needs us to know and have confidence in. So um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Phil did a great job of reading the scripture. I'm, I'm going to come back to it um, specifically. But the three things I want you to tackle today and kind of plant these seeds and keep them in your mind. And, and this is why it was so important to me when I said I'm a, a, I'm a new Christian. I need to know these things. and I think we do too. One, God always keeps his covenantal promises. We've heard that. Do we believe that? Yeah, it, does God really keep every single promise? Every single one? I think it's vitally important, especially as a new Christian, that they answer us emphatically, yes. Why? If a little part of God is wrong, what about the rest of them? If I'm going to worship, if I'm going to praise a God, if I'm going to give my life to him, I need to know that his promise is solid. The second thing that I think we see in this today is that nothing is impossible for God. Yeah, thanks, Pastor Sean. That's so profound. Yeah, you know what? We take it for granted. We do. Everyone believes that God can do anything when we're talking to somebody else. Somebody else is going through a struggle. We, we go, nothing's possible for God. He'll fix it for you. Not, no, no, no. I, I know you have cancer. He can heal that. Your finances? No, no. Have faith. Have faith. Nothing is impossible, God. That's true. Until it gets flipped around. 
Do you feel that way when it's you in the fire? Do you announce as you're walking towards that therapy or that operation, do you wave your hand and go, nothing is impossible with my God? It's a question we're going to tackle today. And then the last part, and this is the fun part for me, God uses impossibles to display his glory. Well, who are impossibles? We're going to talk about that. He uses, I, I thought of an analogy with this. Um, God often makes the perfect cake. And you know what I'm going to point to here in a second. He makes the perfect cake. And we go, that's really good. But what really, what God does is he adds the plus, plus, plus to the perfect cake. And he puts on like nine inches of the best frosting. Because if we're honest, isn't that the part we want from the cake? Right? And that's what God does all the time. And he does that by who he chooses to lay out his plan. And we're going to talk about that today too. So let's, um, let's look at the scriptures here real quick. And I want to recap this, and we're going to talk about Herod quite a bit, but it starts off, um, Luke writes, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, probably our main character for today, uh, the division of Abijah, and he and his wife, um, sorry, he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, an important factor, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous. Remember that. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. These were really good people. Really good people. But Luke writes, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And because, I'm sorry, and both were advanced in years. We're going to talk about that. That's a very polite way of saying old. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the customs of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Big deal. And then he finishes. And the whole multitude of people were painting or praying outside at the hour of the incense when he was doing his job. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw this. I bet he was. And fear fell upon him. Most of us have heard this before. And we look at this and we go, yeah, I get it. But if we're going to tackle the questions I put forward, and the first one is always going, did God, has God, will God always keep his covenantal promises? There's a lot in here that builds up to this, that supports this. Now, the first thing I want to offer you is this. Uh, Pastor Davey, who is a, a great worker of the word, um, and I were talking about this verse specifically, and he said, yeah, we don't expect people, if people just read this and just kind of go, yep, it's true. And, and he said this to me. He said this to all. There was a group of us. He said, "Listen, Christianity, Christianity was never once, never once said, close your eyes, turn off your thinking cap, and try to believe." We're as we come to this the cross, as we give our lives to Christ, He is not asking us. He's not giving us a list of do nots, and we just keep those, and then we turn off our brain, we bow the knee. And we just blindly take everything into account. No, no, no. That's not how God works. And it's not how Luke writes this. God wants us to believe. Should we be faithful to his word? Absolutely. But he does. He does go out of his way to prove that it is correct. Does he have to? No. But he does so that we have confidence. We have confidence in sharing that with others. And, and, and just be able to look in the mirror and say, we got this right. So let's talk about the, the, the promises here. Uh, I, I talked about the priesthood, and I, and I briefly said that the line of Aaron was important. It really was because God made a promise, and we're going to see this in a second, in Genesis. And thousands of years later, for God to be right, that promise needed to come true. It needed to work its way through exactly how God wanted to do that. And the coming of the Messiah, the people who would ultimately be responsible for his life had to fit what Christ, sorry, what God said initially about how he would come. Now, a couple things to take a look at besides having the line of Aaron in play here. And Luke just puts that right in there. Not only remember, I told you that the guy doesn't just make good cake. He, he kind of puts the best frosty on it. This is an example of that. Elizabeth, who is from the line of Aaron, because we know Zachariah is why? Because all Firstborns born in the line of Aaron become what? Priest. 
So it's not surprising that Zechariah is from the line of Aaron, but so is Elizabeth. So that's the plus, plus, plus. So when Zechariah married Elizabeth, that was a good move in the world of priests. He was priest, priest. He was capital P. He did this right. And God orchestrated this so much so. And this is, this is amazing to me. And it should be to you too. If we just look at the names of these two main characters, Elizabeth, it means God is my oath. Imagine being tagged with that. No pressure at all, huh? God is my oath. And then Zechariah is the Lord has remembered. I would expect that of a child that would become a priest. The Lord has remembered. But as we put them together, we see how God so carefully orchestrated even the names of the characters who would play an important role today. We see God as the one who remembers his oath. That, as a new Christian, was really important to me. That, as an experienced Christian, is really important to me. I had no reservations that I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't walk through a valley or two. I knew they were coming. But isn't it not different when you know that God made a promise and he will remember that? Let's move on. Couple points here: forty-eight promises in the Old Testament of uh, in the Old Testament of God's promise of a seed that will overcome the world. And what do I mean by that? For those who are new to uh, to the Christian faith, or maybe haven't read Genesis in a long time, uh, you might be aware of the fact that Adam and Eve kind of screwed up. Most of us know that they kind of dropped the ball. I saw a meme the other day. I don't have this. I should have posted this, but it had a kid with a face gone. And he said, this is the face I'm going to make when I finally meet Adam and Eve. They messed up. They did. They, they, they opened the doors to the world. And God became second to them. And it's heartbreaking because we today experience that. And what God did, and we're going to read this here in a second, is God being a God who keeps his promises says, okay, you messed it up, but I'm going to keep my promise and I'm going to tell you how I'm going to do it. There's going to be a seed. There's going to be a person woven through time, my time, God's time. And it will be perfectly timed, and I will give you this gift. That's why we often see in the Old Testament people going, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the seed? Are you the one? We hoped it was Noah. We were hoping it was Abraham. We, we, we hoped it was Moses. But we all know who the seed is. We know this looking back in time. But God promised 48 times. And why do I bring that up? Is because when someone keeps a promise 48 times, that's proof that he keeps his promises. Let's look at the scripture. Um, I wasn't making this up, I promise you. If you go back to Genesis 3.15, uh, uh, God says, and who is he speaking to? Satan. I will put my enemy between you and the woman. And because your offspring and her, I'm sorry, between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, I thought of an analogy here. Well, how, how do I describe this? Um, we're in North Carolina. Has anybody here killed a snake? Yeah, even Elaine was like, yeah. <laughs> it's North Carolina. We kill snakes. We kill them all the time. Why? Because there's a lot of them. What do you do? Yeah, because they're copperheads. I heard you, Julie. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, they're copperheads. They're not good. So what do you do? When you, you, you know, we do some version of the shovel or the axe or something, and we cut the snake in half. And, of course, it just dies immediately, right? Now, what does it do? It jumps around. It keeps snapping. It keeps biting. You go back there three days later, and it's still going, I'm alive. I got it. it snakes don't die easily. And um, what God is doing here is, is a reflection of that. He's, he's like, you're going to have your time talking the same. You will. You will. You will bruise his head. I'm sorry. You will. You'll bruise his heel. But he, but how do you really kill a snake? You step on its head and you crush it. And he, God, and if you look at this in the original language, there's a, a tone of righteous anger here. And he says, but I will make sure you crush your head. This is a promise thousands of years before this moment. So how do I know God keeps his promise? He fulfills this. I look forward to that day. Isaiah, to go a little bit further into the Old Testament. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, 
the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall, his name shall be called Manuel, God with us. And we read that because we have heard that so many times. Let, let's point out a couple complications in the, in the promise. He did not say, behold, a woman will have a child. I think we ought to go, yeah, that's how it works. See, back then they only had two. Never mind. So we had a woman that had a child. No big deal. That's not what Isaiah says. He says there'll be a virgin. And she shall conceal, conceive a son and bear a son. We had to stop and pay attention to that. How does God keep that promise? Come on. You don't need to be a biology major. Maybe today you do. You don't have to be a doctor to realize that, you know, virgins don't conceive children. Imagine being the hearer of this for the first time. But the people who are waiting on John the Baptist are waiting for this. And they should call him Emmanuel. Who knows what Emmanuel means? Anybody know? Call it out. Say it. God with us. That's right. So he, he is now announcing that there will be a physical presence of God. Physical presence of God. That's a tough promise to keep. He finishes up. Um, I'll share Jacob's blessing to his sons. This is in Genesis 49.10. Who's, who's Jacob? One of the founding fathers of the faith. He's one of the big names. And he's looking at his sons and he says, talking about Jesus, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter representing the king. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Meaning he has full authority. Until the tribute, and, un, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Sound like anybody you know or should know? See, God so perfectly wove all these things together to make sure he keeps his promise. Now, the second thing I promised you is that, that we, we should know, we should feel confident enough to know that nothing is pos impossible for the Lord. Again, that's easy to say to another person. But if you really want to have a relationship with him, is it not important that we believe that? I know I have a daughter. I, what, how profound. I have a daughter, yes. I, I know what she thinks of me. I know she thinks at one time I had a big S on my chest. That I, I could fix anything. Do you think that has an importance to a young lady to see her father that way as she grows up? It does. Now, even more so, our Father in Heaven, who, who controls everything, His hand is on everything, isn't it important for us to know that even if we look at it and we go, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, that you know He can make that happen? Let me give you an example from verse 7. It says, and it's so easy to over -read, just read over the top of this, uh, but, but um, Luke writes, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. He could have easily said they couldn't have children. But Luke being a doctor, knowing facts matter, that someone in the Greek culture would go, yeah, well, she was older, but she was still fertile and she finally had a kid. No, no, no. Luke adds this point purposely and he says, Elizabeth was what? Barren. She was unable to have children. And, and just like just like a good historian, they go, yeah, that's a good fact, but let me add a second one to make sure you understand that God did the impossible. They were advanced in years. <laughs> I, I, I guess maybe it's because I'm getting older, I read that, and I just kind of chuckle. Uh, my, I, I, I read often the Christian Standard Bible. I, I like that translation a little better. It says both of them were, they were well along in years. It's funny, all the old people are laughing. <laughs> and the young people are going, uh, wait till you're well along in years <laughs> and you'll get it. You wake up in the morning, I, I, like I, I preach, I am literally preaching to the choir. I never thought I would say that and mean that. I am literally preaching to the choir. <laughs> it's tough when you get older. You know, getting out of bed, yeah, th that takes time. <laughs> <laughs> when you drop something on the floor and you go, how badly do I really need that? It's hard. But Luke offers this, joking aside, 
there is no way that Zachariah and Elizabeth are going to have a child. God often sets the stage in such a way that there, there is no other option but God. That's not always easy to walk through. I mean, I want you to think about this here for a second. Um, there are some other impossibilities that, that God gives us through Luke here that are a little more painful. For example, uh, Zechariah was a priest. It mattered to him. He was a priest by default because he was firstborn in the line of Aaron. But there were anywhere from fifteen to 20,000 priests. He wasn't special. He was a nobody. And in a lot of ways, he was not, as we'll see here in a minute, not really respected. It, it, we see in verse 9, it says, It happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the customs of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord. We read over that pretty easily, too. But chosen by lot? Well, how do you pick who goes next into whatever responsibility when you have 20,000 people? God again demonstrates. What are the odds of that happening? Not very good. Charlie, one in 20,000. But it happens. So now these facts are building up, and we see not only is God keeping his promise, but he does the impossible. 20,000 pre. Now, let's add a couple other things in here. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. One more time. And we read this, and we think, oh, yeah, that's what happens in the Bible. And there appeared to him an angel, the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. An angel was there. I haven't woken up and walked into my bathroom and there was an angel standing there. It just doesn't happen. It's not what happens regularly in our lives. And God doesn't just go, I'm going to write a little memo. I know he's going to be in the altar of incense. I'm a little sticky. Hey, hey, Zachariah. Yeah, God here. Um, name your son John. No, he sends a messenger. One of the only two angels that are actually physically named in the Bible. We know it's Gabriel because we're told. Can you imagine what that was like? Not only was it the message that was delivered, but do you think it was a little more important because God sent an angel? I love it when people tell me, oh, I you know, heard God's voice. Yeah. <laughs> if you're normal, you don't want to hear God's voice because it's tough. It, 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 usually good things don't happen. And he only sends angels, and you hear his voice when God's not messing around. He's like, enough. This. Do you think Zachariah, being a priest and knowing this, realized that whatever was coming out of Gabriel's mouth was really, really important? We should see that and not take it for granted. Now, a couple other things. Um, we talked about how God keeps his promises. Yes. We all know how God does the impossible. I, I, I think I proved that. Certainly in this case. But this is the part I said was fun, that God uses the impossibles. Who are they? See, even God, Pastor Davey shared with us, even God's authority seems on, when it seems unimportant, he's still in control. And often when we see no way out, he still has a, a, a pathway. We just don't see. And what he does is he uses improbable people, people that we wouldn't pick. Often he uses people that are not good people. Did anybody think that Pharaoh was not controlled by God? He was. Did anybody think, well, he's having a bad week? He's probably a good guy. I don't think anybody thinks that. So does God use all of his creation? He does. Herod is one of them. We will talk in detail about Herod as we go down the line. But, but here's how God uses the impossibles. This was a terrible, terrible time for Zechariah to be a priest. Herod, here's some of his to-do lists for, the, the, uh, for a couple week period of time. He killed three of his sons. Why? Because they were in line to the throne. Does that make sense to anybody? He had nine to ten wives, which makes me question his logic. It's tough with one being married. I can't imagine having nine to ten women. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But just that insult to injury, he killed at least one of them. Why? Because. Not a good guy. His favorite title, and this is ironic. I, I don't think it's ironic. I, think it's, I don't think it's coincidental. I, I think it's uh, sad. What is his favorite title? He was king of the Jews. 
I think we're going to see later on that someone else is going to be given that title. So do you think he'd be threatened by someone who claimed to be the king of the Jews? Again, not a good guy. Not only that, but there was a, mo- a lot of corruption in the Jewish leaderships. I, I hinted that the, the, the priesthood and the, and the leadership of the Jewish wasn't the same as what God intended. All we need to take from that today is that it just wasn't good. It wasn't healthy. And now Zechariah is not dead in the center of this. Pastor Davey also said, and I wanted to share this, he said, even when God seems absent, he still is aware of every sorrow. I included that because we, we tend to say God knows everything even though he doesn't seem to be there. No, 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 no. He goes deeper. He's aware of every sorrow. And why do I bring this up? Because Zechariah was insignificant. We know him because of this book. If we were alive during this day, we'd be like, Zechariah? And even within the priesthood, he was not well respected. Why? He had no children. I'm going to share with you for a second exactly what, what, why, why this would have been tough for him. On top of that, he was living without blame. Remember that in scripture? And he was righteous. Have you ever been in a position when you thought you were doing everything right? You came to church. Sincerely. You, you gave your time, your energy. You read God's word. You were sincerely on the right path. And God just didn't seem to be there. You were going through something really hard. And you begged. There's a difference between praying and begging. And we've all done that. And you're like, I will do anything. God, please heal my, fix my, my son, my daughter. And his voice is quiet. That's a tough place to be. This is where Zachariah is. I don't know. I can only assume. What do you think a man who's older? We're guessing 50 something to 60 something. As a priest. Honoring God. How do you think he prayed. That his wife would have a child. How do you think Elizabeth felt? What do you think the gossip ring around the town sounded like for Baron Elizabeth? There is no one who would write this script and say, let's pick two people for the birth of John. None of them would pick Zachariah and Elizabeth. But God did. He does the impossible with the impossibles. Just to back it up, if you don't have to go here, but Deuteronomy 7 4, this is describing what the life of a priest would be like. So he writes, You shall be blessed above all peoples. I don't think Zachariah and Elizabeth thought they were blessed above all peoples. And then dad insult to injury. They shall not they shall not be male or female barren among you. Not only that, you'll have children. So will your livestock. She doesn't even have a kid. How is God going to use her? Just a side note, to give a little more insight to Zachariah, he could have legally divorced her. He could have left her. And in the eyes of the law, it wasn't a bad thing. It was expected for priests to marry well, he got that part right, but it was expected for them to have children. And as you can see, this is a curse if he isn't. God bless you. All of this to build up to the point where Zachariah is standing before an angel. And we'll dig into that next week. But I, I, want, I want to... Oops, sorry. I, I want to kind of put some meat on the bone. Um, because it's not just Old Testament stuff. Jesus made it perfectly clear in Matthew 19, 26. And I believe if Jesus said it, I think we can take it to the bank. But Jesus looked at them, the disciples, and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. I, I think he takes away any question mark we have. And again, we read this, and we just glance over it. It, it just, does it touch us deeper and more times than... Um, 
at certain times more so? Yes. But don't we just kind of take that for granted? That God can do the impossible with the improbables, and he will always keep his promise. Well, Jesus has it otherwise. And here, we'll, we'll kind of finish this up. Just in case you think that you shouldn't be one of the impossibles, or you don't qualify to be used by God, let's talk about some big names that almost everybody knows, even if you're not a Christian. Abraham. How many think Abraham's important? <laughs> I think he's pretty important. Yeah, he was a liar. And he was a nobody. He wasn't of royal line. God went into the desert, into this area, and said, hey, you, come with me. He did not announce this as the son of a king, of a huge kingdom, that, hey, look, I want to I franchise out. Abraham, come with me. No, he, he took a nobody. And then... <laughs> Abraham lied. How many times? A lot. Almost to the point where God was questioning him. Certainly the people he lied to didn't think he was that special. God did. Moses. I just picked the top one. He murdered somebody. He's a murderer. Yeah, long before the Exodus. He was a murderer. David, David is the one that starts to hit really close at home. Why? Because we know David as a man after God's heart. That's how God describes him. Yeah, he also murdered someone. Who did he murder? He murdered a top confidant, a friend. Forgive me, but to have sex with his wife. And then to cover it up. Does that sound like someone, if you got that on a resume... Would you want them to be part of your team? Probably not. Samson, I just put very bad boy because he was never good. <laughs> There's nothing good about Samson except, obviously, his choice of conditioner. I mean, th there was nothing good about him. And yet God used him in mighty ways. Paul, Paul was Saul. I, I, I have no other way to make it sound any better. Paul went from hunting and killing Christians to being the main influence outside of Jesus, other than Jesus, in the New Testament. Peter, I kind of relate with him. He's impulsive. He has a big mouth. He denied Christ. Well, I mean, I don't have a big mouth anymore, but there was a time. Yeah, no joke there. Really? I can't give you that much ammunition and tee it up like that. I got a huge mouth. Impulsive? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Did I deny Christ? Yeah. It's hard when we look at these people and think God will use them. I never thought I'd be standing here. Never. If I wrote my own script, and here's the truth, and you should take this. If, if I lost you, come back to me for a second. Listen to this. You will never write your own script like God will. If you were given the scroll of your life, the magic pen, and he said, whatever you do, I'll make it happen. You start writing away, I'm tall, I'm rich, I'm happy, I'm blah, 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 blah. You know, I go to school, I change the world, I cure cancer. I promise you, I promise you, you will never write the script like you will. Amen to that, thank you. I can't imagine a life without PJ. Without Mackenzie. But I'll tell you, if you gave me that pen and that scroll at the age of 20 something, they wouldn't be in my life. I never would have known them. And what, what God is doing here is He's explaining to each one of you, and specifically in this case, Zachariah and Elizabeth, that one, I keep my promise. When? Always. I can do the impossible. I don't move mountains. I create them. He is God. And the part that touches me personally the most is he does amazing things with the worst people. People like me. He does the impossible with the impossibles. Even John, the one that Christ loved the most, Face to face with God. And he falls on his knees to worship an angel. 
He gets rebuked for it. My point, what do you take from this? It's not such a bad club to belong to. If you don't think God can use you, he can use anybody. All right, let's tie this up. I told you that God uses the improbable, but there, there, you should know the reason why. Simply, it glorifies him. I know this book. I know a lot of churches teach it's just about salvation. It's just about filling the blank. No, no. This book always has been, always will be about one thing. The glorification of God. We get to experience salvation because of it. But when we look at how God orchestrated this, first there was Zachariah. Nobody. And there was Zachariah and Elizabeth. Two nobodies. With a lot of variables. Then came John the Baptist from them. That's a proud mama and papa. How cool would that be? And then, Jesus. God in the flesh. God with us, Emmanuel. And then Jesus takes the role of Messiah. And the Messiah leads to the cross. And the cross leads to Easter. And then it leads to the salvation of the world. Can you do the impossible? I hope so. Because... We need it. And all of it is for one thing, to glorify God. So I leave, I leave you this quote in one question. Because C.S. Lewis wrote this, and you know I like him. He said, a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by simply scribing the world, scribbling the word darkness onto the walls of his cell. God will do amazing things. God's truth will happen. He will use you whether you like it or not because God is God. So I ask you this last, sum it up and I ask you this question. Is it really God's will? Is it really God's plan? And is it God's time that you embrace? We know he keeps his promises. We know nothing is impossible. Are you willing to be part of the improbable club? Doesn't have to be a person. Could be a church. Could be this church. But the question I offer you is this. Do you trust? Take this personally. I put the word you there on purpose. I'm not playing with pronouns. It's plural and singular. Do you, us, does the church, do you individually completely trust our perfect God to do what is perfect for you? I didn't ask if you like his plan. I didn't ask if you like his goals. None of us like his timing. But what I'm asking is, do you completely trust him? Where are you supposed to be? Who are you supposed to be with? What are you supposed to do? Where do you go? Where do I live? How do I raise my child? How do I raise my grandchildren? Do I sit? Do I stay? Do I pray? Do I talk? Do you wake up in the morning and go, it's all you, God? Or do you go, oh, I've got an opinion. Can I write a little bit of it? Or do you faithfully come to your knees and go, I am yours? Look, if, if you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that we don't come to this point. It doesn't mean that we go, it's going to be really hard this time to trust you. If you're new to this and you're not sure you're a Christian, you're wondering, why should I? This is the question you need to ask. Is God worthy to be trusted completely? I believe that answer is yes. And if you're somewhere in between and you try to navigate through it, come talk to me. Talk to someone who, who, who can clear it up for you. That can offer you some scripture, maybe some insight that shows that God always keeps his promises. That God always does the impossible. And more importantly... He does it in such a way that we just in awe stand there and go, wow, wow, I never would have written the script that way. Thank you, God, for not giving me the pen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your, 
your mercy and your grace. We thank you for even having a relationship with us. We, we take it for granted sometimes, and God, please forgive us when we do. God, when we, when we point to the world and say, you should trust him, sometimes it's really hard for us when that finger points back at us. God, remind us that you are the God of improbable and impossible. You are the God that is a promise keeper. And if you choose, Lord, if it's us that you want on the impossible team, the improbables, the ones that no one else would choose, Lord, we, we open our hands and we say, yes, yes. Oh, we'll do it with fear. We'll be apprehensive. But God, as a church, and as individuals, we proclaim our faith in you. You are a good God. You're a loving God. You're a merciful God. But you are a God to be trusted. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.